All right, so today we're just going to look at some code, mainly. Um, it's just going to we're just going to solve incrementally and using an up, updated Lagrangian technique, and I'll show you that in a second. Just a just a single element. with bilinear shape functions, okay, it's just an elasticity problem. Single element, bilinear shape functions. The boundary conditions are going to be that it's pinned here, and roller here, roller here, and we're going to apply a displacement to these ends, okay? And so, because it it's bilinear, we can integrate it exactly with four nodes, right? So you have, we're going to have four, uh, four integration points, and of course they're going to be at, you know, on the, on the unit square, or on the square that goes from minus one, this guy and exceed eta coordinates, then the integration points are where? Yeah, minus uh, square root of 1 over 3, uh, square root of 1 over 3, square root of 1 over 3, square root of 1 over 3, minus, minus, And uh, so those are the, the locations, the points where we're going to evaluate the integral. And then you remember we also have weights, right? For this two by two rule, what are the weights? One, right? So you won't see them in my code. So I just want to point that out. So the weights are one. So you won't see them there, but just remember if you're using a higher order rule, then you'd have to <coughs> have a different weight there. Or even a lower rule, right? If you use a single point integration, the, r the weight would be two, right? <coughs> All right, so let's look at the code. So can you guys see that? Okay. So, you know, all my, this is all in one file, but at the top I just sort of have a function library and then the, the main routine of the code is down below it. So, you know, uh, I hope by now that you guys are experienced experience enough programmers that you don't write just one long code like you did when you were an undergraduate. It's just for loop, for loop, for loop, for loop, for loop. <laughs> Right, to top to bottom. Right? That's not a very efficient way to code, and it makes it very hard to debug. Right. So, what I like to do, and what I hope you've gained enough experience to do now, is to break your code up into meaningful functions, right, segments, and that way you can. It's much, much easier to debug. Right. So each of these functions, right. So in in Mathematica, which is what I'm using here, uh, a one-line function you can define like I have it there at the top, but then if you need a longer function. Then you use this module, right? So that's sort of alias for function in Mathematica. Right? But the language doesn't really matter. Right? So, uh, so anyway, the first thing we're going to do here is, in, is we need, this is just an elasticity problem. There's no, there's only kinematic boundary conditions. There's no distributed boundary conditions or anything like that. So we don't need the shape functions at all. We just need the derivatives of the shape functions. And since it's bilinear, it's easy enough to just hard code them, right? So what you see up there are the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to C and eta, right? Of course, in the weak form, we need the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to x and y. And so we use this 
Jacobian mapping technique, right? And so that's really what, in the second, um, second function there, so I have a function that's called compute B and J, right? B is the strain displacement matrix, and J is uh, the Jacobian determinant that we need, you know, it's, it's, it's the scaling, of the, it's the volume scaling, or area scaling in the 2D problem. So it's the volume scaling between the parent element and the and the reference element, right? Or the element it exceeds the, on the unit minus one to one, and the and the real element in physical space, right? So J is the the volume scaling or area scaling between those. Okay. Now I said something about updated Lagrangian, so. Because ultimately, I am going to strain this thing a lot. I'm not going to rotate it or anything, but I am going to strain it a lot. And I just wanted a more accurate algorithm. So I'm going to update my reference configuration every time step. Okay? Or, uh, and this, it's a quasi-static problem, so there's really no time. It's every load step. The time is fictitious. So I'm going to apply a load, equilibriate, meaning you know, run it through the Newton algorithm. When I, you know, when I, when I've reduced the residual adequately, I'm going to accept those displacements, deformed positions, and that's going to be my new reference position, and I'm going to do it again. So, in this case, uh, in my compute B and J, I'm going to do it every time, right? Now, if we we're using a full finite deformation theory, we could do a total Lagrangian, and we could only compute B and J once, right? Right at the right at the beginning, because you're not going to update it all. But here. I'm feeding in the deformed position of the nodes every time to compute my B and J matrix. Okay. Xc, so that so compute B and J takes three arguments. The deformed position of the nodes, that's a big vector. Okay. And the integration points Xc and eta that I want to evaluate that function in. Okay? I say it's a big vector. In this problem it's not. It's it's you know, it's just the four nodes in their x and y positions, right? Okay? So then I just take those positions and I break them into two, because that's just one vector that contains all the information. I just break them up into the x and y positions of the four nodes. And then uh, I'm going to compute the entries of that j matrix, right, that was in the node. So j11, j22, and j3, or j21, j22, are you know x dot, so the the deformed position of the nodes is x, dotted with the shape functions, okay, that gives me uh, j1, and and so on, right? And so then the the Jacobian determinant, which is something I'm going to output, all right, of this function, is just the determinant of that matrix. So I just compute the matrix indices, since there's only four of them, it's just easy to do it like that. So I just Compute the matrix indices, and then the, de the determinant of the matrix is that, right? Okay. So then I have to take its inverse. Okay. So I just do that one entry at a time too, because I have a simple formula for the for the inverse of a two by two matrix, right? So those are the components of the inverse of the J matrix, right? By the way, I'll post this code later. In Mathematica format and a PDF, in case you don't have Mathematica, you can just look at the code. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I wanted to. So you said the way to do the updating is by doing mm -hmm. So if you turn in that information and you add them to your uh, determinant, to your return x, and yes. you have new x plus j equals zero, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the only thing that you do, or is that like multiple steps? That's that's the only thing I do to update. Yeah. It's just I take the deform at every step, I take the deform position, and that becomes my reference configuration. And I just do it over and over. Should you be able to put a scale on this thing at all? Because like, uh, I don't know, how, how would you know that you did the right thing? So are you just scored from the previous step? You, yeah, like you'll, you'll see it. Like we do, yeah. Everything's incremental. Yeah. All right. We haven't got the stress yet, right? We're just trying to formulate B, right, the, the strain displacement matrix, okay? So, so then B, remember we had this D matrix with just, when you multiply it by J inverse, it just plucks off the correct entries 
so that you get, because we want the strain displacement matrix. So it has this particular form. It's like a differential operator matrix, right? So you can just go back and look at the notes for the, 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 the derivation of that. That was one of the videos when I was gone I, I gave you guys. All right, so, uh, so that's J. Then, then um, for the N matrix, I just do a little trick where, so I want the derivatives of the shape functions is a one by four. And if, but if you remember in 2D, if you, if you remember in 2D, the N matrix has this shape, uh, N1, X, 0, N1, N2, X, 0, N3, X, 0, N4, X, and then 0, N1, Y, 0, N, Y. These are with deriv derivatives of the shape functions with respect to those entries. In two, zero. In three, y, zero. In four, y. All right, so it has something like that, right? So I just do a little trick here where I just Riffle. Riffle is a function in mathematics. Like, you know, when you riffle a deck of cards, you you interweave the entries, right? So I'm just cheating, right? So I'm taking this, which is a one, you know, has four entries and then four zeros, and I'm riffling them together, so that I, it's it's entry zero, entry zero, right? And then for the y, or the or not, you know, not really y, but xc and eta, right? So in for the eta. Um, I just do it the opposite way. I riffle the zeros with that, so then I get zero entry, zero entry. Yeah. Is there any sort of uh, similar function you want to have uh, in this equation? You can do it through indexing, actually. You could do something like, So um, if I create a vector of random numbers that's uh, 10 by 1, let's say, then I should be able to do something like from 1 to 10 in steps of 2, um, No. Can't you do something like that? Oh, 1, 2, 10. That's right. In Python, it would be 1, 10, 2. OK. All right, yeah. So then, um, yeah. So. So what you could do, I, 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 I need to blow the font up, but I, I don't want to run out of time either. So, so I, it's a little hard to see, but what I did was I created a vector with 10 entries, okay? So they were just just because I needed some r random numbers. What you would actually do is create a vector of zeros, right, with 10 entries, and then index the shape functions at every st step of two, and then in, and then it's good, right? I did the opposite. I, I created random numbers and stuck the zeros in. You okay? Good way to do it? Um, there's probably other ways. There may be a function. That's the way I would probably do it. Simple enough. One line, right? Okay. So, right, then I just, for my B matrix, I multiply that differential operator matrix times the J matrix times the N matrix. And so then I have B, and so then I return from this function B and the determinant of J. And remember, this is going to be evaluated at every integration point. Right? So what will come back in this function is 
B and J at the integration point that I put it in, in the argument. Okay? So then here's my compute stress algorithm. And you'll notice that what comes in is the old stress, the stress at step n. And what comes out is the strep stress at n plus 1. Okay? So we are storing the old stress. Uh, also, what comes in is an increment of displacement, the strain displacement matrix, and material properties. Young's modulus, Poisson ratio, and yield stress, which we're not going to use right now because it's just an elasticity problem. All right? So my increment of strain, then, is my strain displacement matrix multiplied by my increment of displacement. Right? And just I have to flatten it because the way my I store my increment of displacement is that it's X, you know, node 1, x, y, node 2, x, y, node 3, x, y, node 4, x, y. But then I flatten it, then it becomes node 1, x, y, x, y, node 2, x, y, just a one-dimensional vector instead of a 2D array. So I flatten it, then just do the dot product. Now I have an increment of strain. C matrix, this is just, uh, this is just my elastic constants. And I don't remember which one I put it in for, but it's, it's either plain strain or plain stress. And I'd, I'd have to look at it carefully. It's not important, really. OK, so then my new stress is my old stress plus, you know, plus my increment of stress, if you will. The increment of strain times the constants is the increment of stress. Right? So my new stress is my old stress plus the increment. Right? And then I'm going to return the stress. Okay? So then I'm going to compute the internal force. Okay? And this is really where I'm integrating the stiffness matrix. Remember, the internal force is B, the B matrix, times the stress times J. Right? It's, it's that integral, B transpose sigma. So if you had a whole bunch of integration points, you'd put this in a loop, right? But I only have four integration points, so I just hard-coded them, right? So I compute B and J at the first integration point, which is square root of 1 third, square root of 1 third. Second integration point, minus square root of 1 third, square root of 1 third, right? So they're all there. So I have four Bs and Js, four stresses and strains, right? I only, I only keep, keep the strain, I only uh, output the strain increment because I want to plot it later. It's the only reason. Because really you just need the displacement, then you use B to compute the strain. You could throw it away if you don't want to plot the strain. All right, so then this is the integration step. I'm just returning it, right? So I compute the four and then I just add them together. Right? That's what, what we do in the integration. Just add the, the four integration points together, sum them, uh, with the caveat that there should be weights in there, but they're one in this case. Okay? And so I'm returning the internal force, that's what this is, the internal force and the stresses at the integration points. Again, the stresses and strains at the integration points. Uh, the strains because I might want to plot them. The stresses because I need to store them for the next step so that I can increment them. Um, the tangent stiffness matrix, I, I do, this is, we, we'll talk more about it last time, I'm uh, not going to have time, I was hoping to have time today. This, just think of this as a finite difference operation. It's, it's a trick, I'm, I'm using a little trick using complex variables. I'll, t I'll show you exactly what I, how I do that next time. But just think of this, right, I'm calling compute force. Right? With a, de with a deformed position, the delta displacements, the material properties, and the old stresses. Okay? And I call it, and I'm this, this is an operation where I'm perturbing every degree of freedom. Okay? I'll, I'll show you more about that next time. But just think of this as a finite difference operation that gives me back the tangent stiffness. So I compute the tangent stiffness here. That's what's returned from this function. All right? So that's really all we need to start the algorithm. So the, init the initialization is my nodes, the four corners.
my initial displacements are zeros, my initial deformed position is the position of the nodes. Right? At step zero, the deformed position is the reference position. Material properties, initial stresses and strains. I'm using the stress vectors, right? So this is like epsilon, x, x, epsilon, x, y, y, epsilon, x, y. This is just a, something I'm going to plot later, so I'm just storing some empty, an empty numbers so I can plot it later. Okay, so this is the new, this is the Newton iteration. I'm going to do right, or this could be like four. Uh, so I'm going to do something i times. I think in this case, fit, uh, I think in this case there's like 50 load steps. So I'm going to go from zero to one or zero to, I guess, five or something like that in steps of in 50 steps, right? So that's just the load step, which is basically only thing I do in the load step is I apply the load. I take, uh, the, since this is a displacement increment, I could have probably done this more simply, but what I do is I just, every time I allocate a, an array of zeros and then I add 0 0.1, 0 0.01, to the two nodes, uh, you know, so I'm pulling in the x direction on the on the node two and node three, right? Pulling in the x direction, nothing in the y. <coughs> Begin the Newton iteration. So the first thing I do is compute the force with the de deformation. Okay. Now. I have to, so what I get, what comes out of that is, you know, F is really the residual. But where I'm applying, where I have kinematic boundary conditions, either fixed constraints or I'm pulling on it, there should be reaction forces there, right, if the body's in equilibrium. So, <coughs> <coughs> so I don't want those included in my residual cap computation. The residual should be all the other forces excluding the reaction. All the all the forces in the inter in the interior of the body, excluding the reaction forces, should be zero. The reaction. So, so after I compute the residual, everywhere I have every degree of freedom that I have a kinematic boundary condition applied to, I just zero out the residual, and then I compute its norm. So the norm of what's left over, you know, with all the zeros in there. That's the, truly the residual. Okay. And I print out the residual. I say the residual is. Less than this, break. I mean, stop the loop. Get out. Done. Okay? I'm done with that load step. Otherwise, compute the tangent stiffness. Apply the boundary conditions to the tangent stiffness matrix. These are just shorthand ways of putting ones on the diagonal. Right? And then linear solve KF. And then I just, you know, I get back one long vector. It has x, y at node 1, x, then I just put it back into a two-dimensional thing. Right? So then I have node 1, x, y, node 1, node 2, x, y. And in the Newton iteration, I'm going to take 10 steps, 10 iterations. It's adequate for this problem. And you may have to take more if you don't have a good tangent or something like that. My tangent's almost perfect. All right. So now I just update. The stresses, so the, the new stresses, you know, the new, the, the n plus one stresses become the stress, stress ends. This occurs outside of the Newton iteration. So I've been through the Newton iteration. I've accepted my result as the result because I've decayed, you know, I've, I've driven the residual down to near zero. So now that I accept that, I update the stresses and strains, and I'm just, this is my plotting. So I'm only plotting the stress and strain at the third integration point. We could average them or, or, you know, interpolate them to the nodes and then do some type of von Mises stress. We could do a lot of complicated things. All I, I'm just going to plot the stress at that integration point, okay? And then this is the end of that load stepping loop. I'm going to take 50 load steps, right? I think this is just for my own plotting. And then, so I'm going to actually run the code. And you'll see 
this is all the load stepping. So there's the initial residual, and in one step, I drive it to, it disappears. Let me run it again. So in one step, I drive it down to 10 to the minus 17. Why? It's an elastic problem. It's an elastic problem. I can just shoot it right down to nothing. All right? I, I do want to finish this. And my colleague's waiting on, on me, so I'm going to. Okay, elastic problem. There's the stress and strain that I'm plotting. And if you look at it, that's 20, that's 1. If I meet them in the middle, pretty much on that line, 20 divided by 0 0.1 is 200, which was my initial elastic modulus. So it's the stress-strain curve looks like what I input. That's good, right? Okay, let's, let's now change this to be plasticity. The beauty is, all I have to do is modify the compute stress, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is instead of having n plus 1 there, I'm going to change this to the trial stress. Right? So I'm going to take a trial step that's going to be elastic, and I'm going to use that to determine if I'm elastic or plastic, okay? So with that trial stress, then the first thing I'm going to do is compute the trial deviatoric stress. So the trial deviatoric stress is the true stress minus one third sigma kk, right, which is in a 2D problem. Um, yeah, sigma kk times that M, which is 1, 1, 0. So that's the deviatoric stress, right? The stress minus 1 third sigma kk, delta ij, right? But it's a 2D problem, so we do it this way. OK, then. The magnitude of the deviatoric stress is the square root. Now, this is the square root of SIJ, SIJ, which turns out in this case to be um, the trial stress squared, the first entry of the trial stress plus the second one plus the third one. So that's the magnitude of the deviatoric stress. And so then I'm going to say if, that's just saying the real part, and it should always be real, but because of the way I compute the tangent stiffness, there's a little, I'll explain that next time. So I'm saying um, if, if the real part of the deviatoric stress magnitude is greater than two square root of 2 thirds times the yield stress, I'm yielding, right? Now, uh, you know, if I'm yielding, normally if the, if the plastic algorithm were more complex than it is, I'd have to do this complex, you know, delta lambda return myself, right? But since the yield stress, the yield surface doesn't change, I can just set the stress to what it is on the yield surface, right? So I don't actually have to solve for a delta lambda. So in this case, I'm going to set the new stress, sigma n plus 1, equal to the square root of 2 thirds. times y times that q. Remember, q is like the, the q is the direction, right? So it's the trial stress 
divided by its magnitude, right? Okay. And then I just th this that so that's the deviatoric component. Then I just have to add back on the hydrostatic component, which is this thing, right? The thing I subtracted off earlier. If I want the total stress, I have to add it back on. Right, so that's if it's plastic. Um, if it's not, then if it's not plastic, so now I'm out of the, I'm in the else bracket, right? So I said if, if this is true, do update the stress with that, comma, now I'm in the else bracket. So now I'm saying else, if I'm not, if this is not true, I'm elastic, and the new stress is the trial stress. I think that's it. Yeah. I believe if you compute SIJ, SIJ, you can do it symbolically and mathematically. This is what you get. Ah, you're right. It is. You're right. I was being. This? Okay. OK, now if I didn't make a typo and we run this, so we go back down here, sort of look right here where all those residual stuff is going to be printed out. I must have made a typo and it's it's complaining. So there we go. All right, I got a backup plan. I had already worked this out, so uh, let me go to my one that I didn't make a typo in because I already ran it. So uh, if I do run it, what you'll see is now I'm not, it converges quadratically. Well, I mean, it starts off, and in, in you notice right at the beginning, it's elastic. It's elastic, so, you know, at just one step, I get there. And then all of a sudden, it starts taking five steps to converge. It's because I'm getting to that plasticity regime. But if you notice, this, the magnitude of the residual was reducing by half every time, roughly, you know. So it was converging quadratically. So boom, boom, boom. We got there. There's my stress strain curve. Perfect plasticity. Cool, huh? So at some point in the future, in the next few weeks, you'll be asked to extend this to do isotropic hardening, at least. Maybe, maybe Drucker Prager, which is a real geomechanics model. Right? So all right, I got to go.